past is almost sure we have a plan There's clearly maybe something there beyond the realm of man Until we've thoroughly tested every last close-chested view Find the more you think you know, the less you really do Where would we be without THC? We know the lying to us just don't know to what degree Where would we be without THC? The highest side chat show Carl Wood and Company Mother Mithras people drinking a little drink, smoking a little smoke from sunny San Diego. I'm Greg Carlwood, still on a serious high from this episode. The great return of Tracy Twyman. I hope you look good and hard at the title image I made for this one because I included one of the very Masonic tracing board images that the ideas in this show sort of revolve around. I mean, it's a doozy, and I find this really interesting, the overall idea of the elite controlling multidimensional doorways and that the angles, numbers, and symbols within Freemasonry are alluding to this, as well as several of the most well-known pieces of fiction, many by Disney, of course, involving children, which could take on a darker implication when we consider the other unsavory activities of the upper crust. And this particular show is extra nice because we can talk about Tracy's work along with some of the things the mysterious and viral 4chan poster QAnon has been cryptically saying. And I know people have wanted me to cover that more in depth and this would really be our first time with it. And today it's brief so there's probably much more to mine out of it. I've obviously been pretty vocal about not being a big fan of the Trump is taking out the bad guys perspective that QAnon offers. But I've also said that we were going to spend a lot less time on the flat earth, and it is a big part of the paradigm today too. But that's fine. I am not going to quarantine ideas that aren't my favorite necessarily, and I don't think the overall idea that I find so fascinating, which is what Tracy calls hidden hyperspace kingdoms, even relies on either of these things. It's just that from those perspectives, the symbolism takes an interesting shape. And I don't really mean to qualify the show today, I just kept the talking, but the main thing to relay is that some updates and improvements have been made to the Plus site, and everything should be pretty self-explanatory, but I'm going to point out some things in the THC newsletter that you might find useful. You can sign up for that on the front page of the HiresideChats.com, or try to catch it on social media, but I'm going to put it together this week. I'm also going to update the FAQ page to reflect some of those new elements as well. We've also gone over 100 Patreon subscribers, so I promised a Q&A, and I'm still trying to determine the best way to do that. Traditional podcast style or using the new Discord platform in a more live chat type of way. But I'm telling you in advance so we can fill up that Q&A thread on the forums or email me some questions with Patreon Q&A in the subject line and your username so I can be sure you're a Patreon subscriber and I will be sure to get them in there as well. The higher side chats at gmail.com. And the episode today is a bit patchy. We had some weird stuff going on with Tracy's speaker, but you know me here in the compound. I am recording these things six ways to Sunday. So I sat here and jumped from one to the other, whichever recording sounded best for the particular response. So we got there, but you know how people can be. Little changes in the sound and we start to wonder what the hell's going on here. So now you know, but let's do it. Of course, we hear about Freemasonry and mystery schools and paths to ascension and higher consciousness. But what if that's all fluff to hide a literally higher dimension or subspace or world between the worlds? Let's get into it with Tracy Twyman on the other side. They built a little empire out of some crazy garbage called the blood of the exploited working class. But they've overcome their shyness. Now we're calling them your highness. And the world screams. All right, higher side chatters, as we deal with the whirlwind of digital distractions and do our best to navigate the choppy waters of the conspiracy, 
One thing we do know is that the reality we have before us today was crafted from the top down a long time ago. From the international money magic spell and the life essence suck that is the all-important J-O-B, to the ways we think about matter, consciousness, technology, and the upper limits of what might be possible in this human energy farm we call home. Meanwhile, we hear about breakaway civilizations that might be far further ahead than the technological hamster wheels we peons get by on, we know secret societies have held back their own sacred knowledge for decades, and we've seen a long history of scientists who've stumbled off the pre-approved path, suppressed and marginalized. But what if things like the sacred knowledge of these secret orders, the all-seeing eye on the dollar bill, and the mysterious and elusive 33rd degree of Freemasonry all mean something far stranger than we'd ever thought? possibly unlocking hidden doorways and portals to spaces between the worlds where the elite can not only indulge in every luxury and extravagance, but are also able to rule from a place that is truly untouchable. Well, these are the fresh, provocative ideas pouring out of today's guest's latest work, and I can't wait to get more into it. You know Tracy Twyman well by now as she graces the THC digital stage for a fourth time. Tracy first talked to us about her insights into the elite and their connections to dark entities through her own communication with entities such as Baphomet, largely covered in her book Clock Shavings. She then told us about the secret rites of the Knights Templar and their alchemy of finance, which she talks about in her book Baphomet, The Temple Mystery Unveiled. And in her third appearance, we talked about her latest book, a novel called Genuflect. We got into the cult of Mithras and that the elite of today still treasure some very old traditions. And the evolution of these ideas is exactly what we're getting into this time. The revealer of secrets, the teacher of myths, and a true thorn in the side of those pesky occult controllers. Tracy, welcome back to the higher side. Thank you so much. It's nice to be back. And cheers to that. I always love having you here. And the latest stuff you've been expanding on, given the content of Genuflect, is just right up my alley. I have always been interested in the idea of hidden worlds or land masses that used to be in the record, but have moved off of more modern maps. And the threads you've been covering that suggest that these hidden places or maybe even multidimensional spaces could be the secret of secrets within something like Freemasonry is a very new take on some old material, and you make a great case for it. Maybe to get the people's mental gears oiled up and moving in the right direction, remind us of how these ideas are expressed in Genuflect, and maybe the things you've seen in the world lately that mesh with it, as we're closing in on it being out for nearly a year now, I think. Well, I definitely had Hidden Worlds as a feature in the novel Genuflect, Although it doesn't really become clear that that's what's going on until you get towards the end of the novel. It's about alchemical processes that can change the actual outer world. And really, it's about the idea that we're living in the result of an alchemical process. I don't expect all of the listeners to know anything really much about alchemy. But when you think of alchemy, you think about a bottle, right? Like a vase type object where they would do their chemical transformations. If you've seen any of the alchemical images that abound from medieval times and early Renaissance period, that's kind of the idea was that we are living in the result of what an alchemist did to create this world. And then that someone might be able to do the same kind of thing to get out of this world and then create their own. Really, I got that idea out of the alchemy texts themselves where they're hinting at that. I had the novel set during this time period when you and I are are talking. We're talking in the last week of March, and this weekend is going to be Easter and also April Fool's Day. And I took advantage of that in my novel, where that's the time in which the characters are doing an alchemical occult ritual tied into the rites of Kybel worship from Rome, an old Persian slash Roman cult, and also tied into the rites of the Templars. And they're doing a ritual to open up a portal between our world and a higher realm. There's all sorts of symbolic reasons why this ties into Easter, this type of ritual. The idea is that we're in an alchemical vessel and there's a real outer world outside of that. In the novel, I don't want to give away too much, but basically the rituals that they do at Easter time 
have an effect on the outer world and some of the things that become visible to people in our world as an effect of the ritual include all of these anomalies in the sky, such as changing color of the sun and the moon, also two suns visible at the same time. And then there's spheres. The planets actually become balls that come down from the sky. And in some cases, one of them ejects a fluid down into the River Thames, and the other one drops down a golden chain from its body. And all these weird things are seen happening in the sky. What's really strange is that I only knew a little bit, really, about some of the things that people have been seeing lately in the sky over the last few years. When I wrote the novel, I didn't know that much about what was out there. Since finishing the novel, I've learned a lot more, and I've seen a lot of it myself. What I'm talking about is the change of the color of the sun and the sun blinking, which has been seen a lot lately, and a black dot in the middle of the sun is seen a lot. A lot of this stuff really resembles stuff I had in the novel and stuff that you see in alchemical texts, alchemical drawings, and they're always really cryptic. You wouldn't be able to tell at first glance what is communicating, but a lot of them do show multiple suns, changing color of the sun, and the heavenly bodies ejecting things into or pouring down stuff from their bodies onto the earth. The strange thing is, of course, people have always taken those to be symbolic of various things, chemical processes and even spiritual processes. I decided to take a literal approach in my novels to actually have those things happening on Earth. And I think that was the right approach to take because it's become clear to me since writing that story that I think we do live in an alchemical vessel. I mean, we've talked before about flat earth theories and you know, some people think we're basically in a snow globe. I think that may be true very literally that we're in one of these vessels and the chemtrails. I mean, I found alchemical images from hundreds of years ago with cloud formations inside of the vessel that look very similar to what people are seeing in the skies now. And people have been thinking for a while that they're trying to cover up something in the sky. In my novel, I had the sun being an artificial object, a diamond, actually, and that it's coming through a hole in the sky and filtering what I called hyper-uranium light from beyond our universe. There's a hole in our universe. The sun is like a crystal that plugs up that hole, acting as a deck prism and letting this higher frequency light from outside of the box that we're in, it filters it and lets it in, and that's the sunlight that we see. So that's the kind of imagery that I had in the novel. And I'm realizing more and more that I think I was kind of close to reality. And the stuff that people are seeing this week and more broadly over the last few years in the sky, it just freaks me out how how similar it is to the stuff I had in my story. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, it is interesting. A lot of people are examining the whole environment, looking at the moon and the sun as possibly artificial. And I mean, that's pretty provocative. I also kind of wanted to read this from your latest article because you talk about our buddy Crow and his lunar wave stuff, which might relate to this because you write YouTube star, Crow 777 has realized that the lunar wave he's been filming on the surface of the moon every vernal equinox for years is actually the gate of the souls of men opening up, the gate through which we ascend and descend for earthly incarnation. He has also figured out that these gates are physically connected to the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn and that these are among the secrets encoded in Masonic tracing boards. He also says that authorities and experts are lying about when the equinoxes are actually occurring. Lunar waves are occurring on nights of equal day and night, which he says from observation are presently occurring on different days at different places around the world, according to empirical observations of his listeners. So provocative stuff. And it is very timely for this week, as you mentioned. Maybe the moon or the lunar wave is some kind of time marker or gateway to this realm, just as the sun is. Is that kind of the suggestion that this is all some kind of artificial construct, like a slaughterhouse we aren't aware of? Yes, and 
I don't know where you draw the line even between artificial and natural. If the world is created by God, then it's God's artifice. <laughs> but I think it's just we imagine the world being, I guess we have our own ideas, our own definitions of what's natural and what isn't. So when we finally start seeing the mechanics of how it's built, we start seeing the edges of the box, then we feel like there's something unnatural about that. But maybe it, we could just say whoever created this is the god of this world or the demiurge, you know, he's the one who created this stuff. And I don't endorse any particular model, but I'm pretty convinced at this point that we have not been told the truth about the limits of our known world and universe. I honestly do not believe what we've been told about the history of space travel. I don't know to what extent any of it is true. But I think that there have been enough holes punched in the official claims about everything from the Apollo landing to the alleged missions that are occurring right now in space and everything we've supposedly learned from that. I think the holes have been punched. And so the authorities have been proven to be liars. And then we're just sort of left to try to figure out everything on our own from there. And it does help, I think, to go to older texts. And I also think that historical chronology is questionable. So I don't know what to say exactly about what is the most reliable text, but we can definitely say that, you know, before we were born (laughs) at some point, our ancestors had a different understanding of the world around them. The idea of there being gates in heaven, one which souls come into this world incarnation through, and one which they exit out of, well, that wouldn't have been too weird of an idea to our ancestors. And the idea that the sun and moon kind of act as doors to those portals appears to be throughout all kinds of Greek and Roman and Sumerian and other types of what we call ancient mythology. And you can also see it encoded even in Christian scripture and stories. Then it's all over Freemasonry, of course. And I find those tracing boards to be very valuable, at the very least showing you what they, whoever designed those tracing boards, believed. I honestly do think we're looking at an accurate portrayal of the kind of world we're in. Yeah. Because the types of tracing boards I'm talking about are the types that show three pillars. It's common to see two with an I in between them. You'll see this almost as a logo all over the place. The two pillars that are supposed to be the two in front of Solomon's temple, so Joaquin and Boaz. And they're supposed to represent these two polar opposites, male and female, and mildness and severity, or mercy and judgment, being hard and being soft, basically, right? Right. Then there's a third option there. And this really corresponds also to the Kabbalah, the Tree of Life, on that diagram of the universe in that particular mystical tradition, there's three pillars holding up a, what they call a tree, some kind of diagram of the different spheres of existence. And so you have the two pillars on the side, right and left, that correspond to Yaquin and Boaz, like I was describing, but then there's one in the center. The ones on the right and left are shorter than the one in the center. The one in the center goes all the way from the total absolute bottom of the system, which is Malkut, to all the way to the top, which is the crown. The other two pillars don't go all the way to the top, right? You have to take a detour in order to get up to the top. My point is, the pillar in the middle is the only one that will take you all the way from the bottom to the top. That's the main elevator shaft. Right. Whereas the other ones, they don't go as deep or as high, right? Yeah, they don't go to every floor. And I just think that's... uh... (laughs) Such a fascinating idea, this this concept of hidden hyperspace kingdoms of places that are off the map, so to speak. And I know, obviously, this is an audio show, but when you look at those tracing board images you've pulled up on your website and the checkerboard floor, all the symbolism involved in the ladders that go to the sky or the ladders that go to the sun or the people coming out of the sun and filtering down to the... Masonic tracing board. I mean, those images in the context of a secret space or there being a room to a secret area or you can unlock a portal with magic. 
it kind of makes sense in that new context. And it's just a really interesting idea. It also kind of ties into the 33rd degree you've talked about, the symbolism there that on the typical compass, there's 32 degrees around the planet. In masonry, there's 32 degrees. And then there's this honorary hidden 33rd degree. Or like to use the elevator analogy, there's another level that the elevator in typical everyday consensus reality doesn't quite get to. Yes, and as your guests in the past that talked about Flat Earth probably pointed out, there's a azimuthal equidistant map that's the logo for the UN that Flat Earthers believe actually represents the real Earth. And in the UN logo, it's divided into 33 segments, and that 33rd segment is in the center where the North Pole is located. Now, mainstream geography says that there's nothing there except ice. But as you just mentioned, yes, the compass for spatial directions is divided into 32 degrees. Freemasonry has an honorary 33rd degree. I believe that 33rd degree can be thought of as representing the step to a higher dimension. I think that that step to a higher dimension might be physically real and located in our world right there at the North Pole. And the reason why I think that is because there are ancient maps that put a mountain there called Rupus Nigra, meaning Black Mountain or Black Rock. It's associated with the myth of the world mountain that's the highest mountain in the center of the world. You find this archetype in all of the ancient traditions. And the idea is that this is the mountain of the gods. At the very top of the mountain, that's the Olympus realm or the Eden realm where the gods themselves actually live. But most people, for one thing, they never get to go to the mountain and then they never get to see the very top of the mountain. I think this is the same mountain that's described in Rosicrucian literature and in stuff published by the Priory of Zion, for instance. And by Brené de Mal, who's a surrealist writer. He only wrote one novel, really, but it's about this invisible mountain concept, the idea that there is a mountain that's taller than any other mountain in the world, but you can't see it. And the prior of Zion described it as a mountain where you can't see the summit, except as a special day when the sun is hitting it in a certain way. The reason why, according to the prior of Zion literature, and what I'm talking about is their poem Le Serpent Rouge that they put out where they were describing this mountain. And they said that this mountain is where the hidden temple of Solomon is located. I mentioned they said that you can see it when the light hits it a certain way at noon. Well, that's when the sun is at the very top of the sky. And that's when it's supposed to be putting out the whitest light it's going to put out. So it puts out pretty much pure white light at its meridian. And that's when, according to this poem, this special mountain can be seen. What I'm thinking is that, yes, I think that there is land on Earth that we can't see, but that perhaps those who are initiated or who have access to special information and maybe special technology, they can see it. And it's literally there. You might even be able to see it yourself in the right lighting conditions. So that's why I think you can see the mountain at noon if you're right up on it. And I think that there might be lots of other stuff that we can't see because the light isn't hitting our eyes in the right way. And I think that that's key. In the Masonic tracing boards that I'm talking about, the two pillars, they show sun on the left, moon on the right. So you got the moon and the sun on top of each one of the pillars, usually, in these Masonic tracing boards. But then there's a third luminary in the center. And that is represented variously, either as a sun that is bigger and brighter than the regular one, the one that's on the left, or it can also be shown as a hexagram or a square and compass or an all-seeing eye, usually inside of a triangle. So sometimes it's just shown as the keystone itself. Usually when there's three lights, and usually there's three pillars in these instances too, there's an arch going between the first two pillars, right? So in the keystone position of the arch, 
that is the center, you know, the keystone position. That's where this third light or luminary is represented, either there on the arch itself, right below it or right above it. Now, sometimes they'll show the keystone and show it having been removed. And they'll show this luminary shining through the hole that's made in the archway. It's pretty obvious if you look at it, but if it's not obvious enough, the Freemasons actually spell it out in their own books, such as the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry by Albert Mackey. They talk about how the Masonic depictions of Solomon's Temple really are showing you the world and actually the universe. And he specified that it's the world as it was known in Solomon's time, or in other words, the old world, but it's also really the whole universe. Right. They're very cryptic, the Masons, about what all this means. But I have seen enough of these pictures and correlated them that I think I figured it out. The arch is the firmament. The light shining on the outside, the third light that I'm talking about in the middle, is what I described in the novel as the hyper Uranian light. It's this light that's thought of as preceding the existence that we're in, and it's outside of the firmament above the dome that they say is protecting our world from the chaos or whatever it is that's outside. I think there's definitely wavelengths of light that are up there that we can't generally handle looking at. And I think maybe our sun does act as a filter so that we can have some of the light that we need, but we're not exposed to all of the wavelengths that are damaging to us. But I think that if you can safely use some of these other wavelengths of light, they might allow you to see some of these hyperdimensional things and these other land masses. And I think that that's what these tracing boards are showing you. For one thing, I've seen a Masonic image where it actually shows guys in a Masonic lodge doing divination ritual together around a table. And they've got the keystone removed so that the light is coming in from outside of the universe and it's pouring through a window into their lodge and then onto a mirror that they have set up in front of their table that they're working. The image from the mirror then bounces down from there onto this diagram that they have laid out on the table and it's a Masonic tracing board. So they're bringing in the hyper uranium light, bouncing it off a mirror, and then it's illuminating things on a tracing board on the table in front of them. Tracing board of Solomon's Temple, which we've been told by the Masons themselves represents the world. Right. So that's one way of, I suppose, safely utilizing this light to see things and actually have it show you things on a what's essentially a map. And I think that it could work in a much more straightforward way if the keystone literally did open, which I think may either be happening or maybe it happens periodically. But I mentioned before how people are seeing strange things in the sky, strange colors to the heavenly bodies. And then there's all of this chemtrailing, which seems to be the purpose to blot out the sun and to make us see less of what's going on up there. I don't know what exactly they're hiding, but the sorts of anomalies that people are describing seem to me like the kind of thing you would see if different wavelengths of light were suddenly getting through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is a pretty amazing idea. And you are right. The sun is on the left and the moon is on the right in these images. And anyone can Google image search Masonic tracing board and see what we're talking about here. There are variations, but for the most part, you have the checkerboard floor and the left and right pillar. And then, of course, that central one. And whereas the sun and moon are on the sides, usually there's some kind of star or opening with light pouring through put over the third one and a golden road with people coming out of it. And in a lot of cases, the ladder is placed diagonally over that third pillar, almost to symbolize a ladder to some kind of subspace. I mean, I can see it. And maybe this long history of Masonic teachers coming out to the public and saying it's all about higher levels of consciousness or that the ranks of Masonry are just about enlightenment, it would be a good cover story and not exactly a lie either. It is about higher knowledge because only they know how to open the doors and get out of this place. 
probably by magical means. And, you know, yeah, the flat earth paradigm is very polarizing and not exactly my favorite model at this point. But if we're just trying to present the clearest case for your perspective, you could take the observer effect literally and you could look at these tracing board images as more literal than most. And you have yourself a really enticing interpretation that is very unique where you have Freemasonry saying in these images, hey, <laughs> you're too dumb to realize you're in a spiritual prison and a literal one. You stick to your 32 degree construct. We're the gatekeepers to the outside, whatever that is. And we only share that information with those who make it to the 33rd degree. We don't even admit that exists, which is another double entendre of symbolism. <laughs> I know it's a bold suggestion, but I know I'm not going to be looking at these images the same way again. Can I elaborate a little bit more? Please, sure. Okay. There's way more about hyperspace in those images if you just really, really look at them. One of the things is there's the three pillars, then there's usually a ladder going up to this gateway that I described, the hole in the sky. But the ladder is shown leaning up against nothing. So you wonder what's holding the ladder up. And I think it's a fourth wall. You don't see what the ladder is leaning up on because you're not seeing the other dimension that they're pointing to. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen stuff like this happening recently. I know this is going to sound totally crazy, but one of the things I've seen when there's heavy chemtrailing in my area is what I've called non-Euclidean clouds. The clouds will actually bend the light and make everything look weird where it's bending one way at the top and then bending another way at the bottom. And I've actually seen this horizon in the skyline look like it's just a flat wall in front of me. Hmm. So I don't know what that means exactly, but I think it's tied into this, that if you could see the other dimensions, some things that look like they go on into the distance, you might all of a sudden see walls in certain places. Whoa. <laughs> the other thing that indicates hyperspace to me is the way the pillars themselves are arranged because they're not equal distance apart like they are on the Tree of Life. This is a multidimensional picture, but the pillars are arranged in such a way that if it were made into a two-dimensional picture and you were looking from the top down, it would be a right-angled triangle. When you're looking at it from the front, when you're walking down the path that they usually show on these tracing boards through the first and second pillars, you wouldn't at first glance see the third pillar. It's off to the side a little bit, and that's the way they usually show it. In one of the tracing boards that I have, it is even like barely visible behind the right pillar. And that's just showing you that you have to look in a certain way at a certain angle and the light has to hit your eyes in a certain way to be able to see what is between the first and second pillars. And what are the first and second pillars precisely? They are poles. And you know how I know is because there's actually always a directional compass put on the outside of the tracing board. And east is put at the top. And so... The right and left pillars, the two that are in the front, those represent the north and south poles. And so this is showing you a third pole beyond the north and south poles. That is the higher dimension that we're talking about. I mean, it does exist. It has its own direction. It has its own space. We just don't have a compass that can include that. But it's just as real. It's not ephemeral. It's not just like something that is nebulous and doesn't mean anything. It has its own maps and terrain if you could find the right light to look at it with. Man. I think that's what they're telling you there. So <laughs> I love it. I love it. And you've been writing and thinking about things in this lane for a long time. And to approach it from a slightly different direction, we now in the past few months have this 4chan poster who's been getting a lot of attention, claims to be an insider who is very close to the president and goes by the moniker of QAnon. To be honest, there is no subject that's been requested more from the audience lately than an in-depth look at QAnon, and I've avoided it because I just don't want to jump on the trendy conspiracy stories that come out like this too early, 
I don't want to just go where the wind blows. And it's highly possible this is another in a long line of internet hoaxes. I'm not a huge fan of this Trump is a dark horse rising up to fight the New World Order narrative, and that is an aspect of the QAnon stuff. But I'm going to be open-minded, and disclaimers aside, I've looked at how a lot of people are covering QAnon, and you take it into these ideas that we're talking about, that I brought up in the intro, and you kind of relate it to your work in a way that's pretty mind-blowing. I guess, can you introduce Q to the uninitiated and talk about how it ties into the ideas that we're talking about? Well, I'll do my best here. And I've got to admit, I have not had much time to look at what Q has been posting lately. But thumbnail, I guess, is that here's a guy who supposedly is on the inside of the Trump administration to the point where he's next to the president frequently throughout the day, plotting things in secret with him and other secret co-conspirators, supposedly. And he's painting a picture of a revolution happening within the elite. This is all stuff that's being released in the politically incorrect segment of 4chan. This is a website where people can post things anonymously. And that's why sometimes intelligence is dropped from whistleblowers on 4chan. But it makes more sense to go to WikiLeaks or someplace like that. But anyway... 4chan, you can actually have a discussion with people about it, I guess. And so that's what's going on. He's been dumping all of this information. Most of it is riddles and written cryptically. Some of it contains predictions, some of which have come true. Most of them haven't. It seems they haven't. And so I understand what you're saying about how you don't know whether to take it seriously or not. I don't either. I take it seriously. I guess I can say that, but I don't know what exactly to make of it. I do feel that the president is in on this. That doesn't mean that what Q is saying is true, because this could all be an elaborate psyop, which the president himself is in on. Hmm. But I agree with you about wanting to be very cynical of the idea that he's any kind of hero, and especially that he's against the New World Order, but he's secretly hiding amongst them to try to fight them on the inside. That's definitely what Q wants you to think, to the point where he's sending out messages in response to Lynn Rothschild's tweets. And then it seems she's responding to him, and they're making death threats to each other and things like that. The thing that makes it seem like there's some legitimacy to the claim that it's originating from the president's office is that there have been things where the Q person said something in one of his messages and then the president's own tweet used the exact same language within a couple of minutes of the post. Mm -hmm. So things like that definitely make me think that the president's office is in on it. But yeah, I don't know if it's true or not. The only reason why I really got involved in writing about it was just because it did seem to me like whoever Q is had been reading my website. Hmm. Because they were talking about some of the stuff I was just describing about hyperspace, using cryptic language, using some of the same metaphors that I had been bringing up in my writings lately. And that made me think that me writing about some of these particular metaphors and symbols brought it out in the open and made whoever Q is feel like it's okay to talk about this now. What I'm talking about specifically about some of his code words, he keeps saying that we need to expand our thinking. He keeps referring to maps and really to territory that isn't featured on the regular maps. And most people think that this is a metaphor for something else. And they keep looking to current events and history, analyzing different conspiracy theories, they keep looking to Pizzagate stuff to try to correlate this. And then also, I guess there's some people who think that it has to do with North Korea and that North Korea is really a Potemkin village. It doesn't really exist. This is some stuff that's been hinted at by Q, that North Korea is kind of a puppet pretend enemy built up by the CIA. And so some people think that the comments about the map are referring to that. But I think it's hyperspace kingdoms, things that aren't on the map because they're hidden from us. The whole thing started really right around the time 
that Trump went to Saudi Arabia and there was a change in power over there. A whole bunch of Saudi princes got arrested and their stuff was confiscated. So Q, when he first came out, one of the first things he was talking about really was that there's tons of resources the elite have tied up. And he was promising people they're going to take it and redistribute it, essentially. And that hit me right away as being relevant to what I was starting to realize, that if there's hidden territory, and God knows how much there is, well, you know, that's all got a real estate value. There's probably gold and diamonds there. And God knows what kind of technology and other types of resources we can't even imagine. And look at the conditions that we're living in here on Earth where it seems like, you know, maybe we have enough resources, but definitely our monetary system is so effed up that they'll never be distributed to everyone that needs them. Every country is in debt. We're all slaves to these banks that seem to control everything. And there's only a few people in control of those. Well, what if what Q is suggesting is true, that those elites are all criminals? And there's really only a few of them. They have all these resources that we don't even know about. You know, he was saying, yeah, you think that, you know, who the richest families are. You don't know who they are. I mean, you don't know how much money they have. Because whatever they get caught lying about on their taxes, well, that's just a fraction of whatever they're hiding from you. Right. So that was just the hint. When I started noticing that some of the code words seem to have to do with hyperspace. Oh, and they, don't they always say that people who believe he's a dark horse, they say he's playing four-dimensional chess? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> that made me think this is what we're talking about. And then he started talking about Sleeping Beauty and telling people to look for Sleeping Beauty and her castle. Well, in the Priory of Zion poem, Les Serpent Rouge, that I was telling you about, where they describe the hidden mountain, and the hidden Temple of Solomon, they also describe it as Sleeping Beauty's castle. If you think about it, it makes sense because that middle pillar in the Kabbalah is the same as that middle pillar on the Masonic tracing boards. That's the one that's hidden. It's sleeping because you don't see it usually. And in the Kabbalah, the name of the pillar in the middle is Hebrew for the word beauty. Hmm. So, yes, I absolutely think the Sleeping Beauty references in QAnon are a reference to the middle pillar as the route that you take to get to the hidden hyperspace kingdom. Uh Just like on the tracing board, they show often a path. Sometimes it's a ladder, like we were saying, leaning up against nothing. But sometimes it's a pathway. Kind of reminds me of the yellow brick road in The Wizard of Oz. (laughs) But it starts out straight, and then it starts twisting and it looks like it's going down in the beginning, and then it starts to go up. Right. So it's a non-Euclidean pathway leading up into a higher dimension. <laughs> and that was going to be one of my comments, that this does look like the yellow brick road to the technologically advanced and mystical city of Oz, but also that there are a lot of Disney movies that revolve around people, mainly kids, being transported to a different realm. And that is the hero's journey. But even just looking at the details of some of these tracing boards, I see images that look a lot like the tumbling down the rabbit hole scene in Alice in Wonderland. And then you have the kids from Peter Pan. They fly off to Neverland and they aim at a star that's shining just like these images. So it does make you wonder, maybe the Masons hold the key. And I was even thinking the other day about all the Masonic symbolism in D.C., how America was called the New Atlantis. And then we have these weird systems of measurement that are separate from the metric system. And for example, water freezes randomly at 32 degrees. Oh, yeah. Like it's encoded to be the transmutation point, which is just sort of a weird tangent. But I bring this up because you talk about Disney in one of your videos. People dismiss the idea of him being a Mason But apparently he was in the De Molay Society, which was a Masonic grooming organization for young kids. He seemed pretty well versed in the mysteries regardless. And Disneyland does have that elite Club 33. Maybe he knows something we don't. But to tie it all the way back to QAnon, let's talk about Tomorrowland. Because as well as Sleeping Beauty, this was another 
Disney thing that he referenced, right? Yes, he mentions Tomorrowland a lot, which I had only remembered being one of the sections in Disneyland. A couple years ago, they made a movie about it. George Clooney's in it. But that is about Hidden Hyperspace Kingdoms exactly. It's about, okay, if this isn't creepy, especially after the Pizzagate stuff came out. All right. The story is that there's a hidden world where the elite hide their technology they don't think the world is ready for yet. And it's accessible through it's a small world, which, okay, there's some symbolism there. We're in a small world compared to what the real world is. Yeah. The thing is, the kids that they decide are going to be kids are going to be initiated into the secrets of Tomorrowland. They choose kids that they think are especially intelligent, and then they give them a special lapel pin. They don't know what it means. Then they go on the ride. It's a small world. And when they go past a certain point in the ride, a laser goes out and touches the lapel pin. And then once that happens, a gateway opens up and then they go into Tomorrowland where, you know, everything's flying cars and everything's the Jetsons future. The point is Disney touched upon this idea, spelled it out exactly, precisely what I was describing. And, you know, the real reason why I thought about it as being so specific and about it being a place where the elite of this world, this flesh and blood world might hide to get away from the rabble is because that's what the story is of Atlas Shrugged and Ayn Rand wrote. And I think that had a lot to do with inspiring this Tomorrowland idea. It's very similar. For people who aren't familiar with Atlas Shrugged, give us the details of the similar portion because you are right. It's an exact match. Okay. So again, the idea coming out of Ayn Rand's philosophy and attitude to life I think she was using the world analogy. The the true story of Atlas is that he's holding up the sky. But since the world has been thought of as a globe for recent years, a lot of times when people see the image of Atlas holding up a globe, they think it's the world. And so people think Atlas holds up the world. He's supposed to hold up the sky. The metaphor still kind of holds. But the point is that she's comparing the elite to the ones holding everything up, keeping everything going. And that they're overburdened by that and by the problems created by regular people. Regular people are so stupid and needy that they're the ones ruining everything. So anyway, the world is a dystopian future in which the price of gas has gone up so high that people don't drive much anymore and there isn't much air traffic. And instead, people take trains. And so the main character is in the train business. And the point is just that everything sucks because supposedly the government's been taken over by people with a liberal mentality. They're putting all of these unnecessary requirements on businesses and high taxes. Therefore, it's just too difficult to run a business and it's not worth doing anymore is the idea. That's why everything's falling apart. And so... One of the guys in the story, and he's not even a business owner, he's just a mechanic at a shop, but he happens to be a genius, and he invents this free energy machine. And I haven't finished reading the novel, so just a caveat there. It may very well be that it makes more sense in the novel than it did in the movie. Assuming that the movie is based on the novel, it's kind of weird, because she's describing it as like a mini particle accelerator, and yet she's also saying that it's a Tesla device. And I just can't see those two things being the same object. But Mm -hmm. at any rate, it's a little tiny free energy machine. This guy, John Galt, makes it. And then right about the time that he's finished with it, he realizes that it's just not worth showing the world this thing. And he'd rather disappear and create his own world with people that he thinks are worthy of breathing his air, you know? And so he does that. And that's, you know, the main character starts the story discovering his hidden world. He creates one of these hidden worlds with his quantum technology or whatever it is. He creates a world within the Rocky Mountains that you can't see from the outside. And there's a force field around it. And she manages to get through with an airplane. Her airplane crashes through and she discovers this world. He's 
brought all of these people that he's chosen. He brings them one by one. John Galt does. He picks people that he thinks are worthy and going to contribute to his society. And he invites them to come to a place where they'll be rewarded for their efforts and everything will be fair and based on merit. And one by one, every single one of these people chooses to leave the life that they have. And in some cases, their families, in most cases, their businesses, and they just disappear and nobody knows where they're going, but they're really going to this hidden world. And the name of the hidden world is Atlantis. (laughs) So there's a number of reasons why she could have chosen that stemming from Greek mythology and Atlantis is named after Atlas. Supposedly, it's a different Atlas than the one that holds up the sky. But I think they're the same. I think Atlantis is the same kind of idea, the actual Plato story of Atlantis. I think they're describing a hyperspace situation there, too, because I think they're describing the world that we used to have, the universe, really, sort of dropping down into a dimension below our perception. And that's why the stories are a little bit weird. It doesn't really fit into chronology, and yet we all have a story about Atlantis or the Flood. But that's sort of a side issue, but yeah. I just think this is so fascinating, and I've been pretty critical of the Flat Earth perspective lately. But, you know, regardless of that, one of the things people always say is, well, who cares? What would the motivation be to hide the shape of the Earth? Well, that's what this whole conversation is. This is clearly a motivation. If this is a construct, some artificial reality, some slaughterhouse or terrarium, and only the 33 degree Freemasons have found the way out of it. I mean, we are in a zoo. We are in a prison. This whole economic enslavement model, the way the whole planet or whatever it is, the whole plane is under the influence of the elite. I mean, This is their playground for our consciousness, basically. This is our prison. I mean, this would be the biggest motivation of all. It makes a lot of sense. And you talked about or you mentioned Tesla technology, and that is a huge thing to tie in here, because if we're going to try to bring QAnon, hyperspace areas, Freemasonry and Trump all together I mean, we know that John G. Trump was his, you know, Trump's uncle was the guy who actually was responsible for looking over Tesla's material when they took it, when they confiscated it from Tesla, when he died. This is not a secret. I mean, it's very public information that Trump's uncle was this guy. Well, maybe Trump's uncle learned in Tesla's documents about some of this very stuff. And maybe Trump does know about it. Maybe this QAnon stuff is related because, like you said, he does mention seeing the world differently from a high enough vantage point. He talks about maps and legends and keystones and the 40,000 feet number. He says, what is SpaceX? Expand your thinking. That's a quote. This kind of is interesting, you know? I mean, you've even made a video talking about Mar-a-Lago and the fact that you can't get into that club without paying something like $100,000 a year, well, what could go on there? Could that be a portal to one of these hyperspaces? You would never know unless you're going to fork over $100,000 to crack that inner circle. And what's worth $100,000? Do people get rich by giving their money away for no reason? I mean, usually they have to make some smart financial decisions to keep it all. You don't make money by giving it away. So what is a value at Mar-a-Lago for that price tag that you can't get anywhere at any nice resort. So there are some interesting aspects that possibly tr- tie these things up. And maybe it relates also to Plus Ultra. That's a big can of worms, but go for it. Yeah, no, Plus Ultra, yes, is a motto that actually appears in the tile work at Mar-a-Lago. And there could be any number of reasons for that. I mean, it's just a Spanish decor that they chose. So this is a Spanish origin phrase, not necessarily Spanish origin. It's a Latin phrase, but is really made famous because of its use on coins that were minted by Spanish royal family around the time that they started colonizing the new world. And they found lots of gold and silver when they did that. And so they started minting lots of coins. Some of them got used by the colonists over here. In fact, those were the first dollars that were used were actually Spanish coins. And they had this motto on them, plus ultra, with the two pillars, which represent the pillars of Hercules. 
And so the point of using that phrase on that coin, the phrase means there is more beyond. And so it's saying there's more to our empire, the Spanish royal empire, beyond the pillars of Hercules. There's more land, there's more stuff, more money. <laughs> wow, to see that phrase popping up in such specific places is quite interesting. So yeah, just as the two pillars of Hercules seem to represent to our ancestors to represent sort of a boundary where they didn't know what was in the oceans beyond the two pillars. Well, here they can represent the same things as the two pillars on the Masonic tracing board, which, as I pointed out, that's the North and South Pole. So that designates the limits of the world that at least you and I can experience as non-astronauts, right? We can only experience things that are between the North and South Poles. Of course, we think of it as a sphere, so it's hard to even think of those two things as enclosing something, but that is the way that we need to look at it to understand this. And then the idea is there's something beyond that. Now, Plus Ultra also happens to be the name of the secret society in the movie Tomorrowland that runs Tomorrowland. And supposedly, both Tesla and his arch enemy. Thomas Edison were members of Plus Ultra together in the movie. That's what they say. That's interesting in itself. They're showing you members of the scientific elite we thought were enemies, but they're saying, oh, no, they're really friends if you actually go into the secret world where the elite live. Actually, they're buddies, which is just like what really happens at elite parties where people who are political enemies have sex with all the same prostitutes together. <laughs> it's, again, a, a true depiction of what's really going on here. The funny thing is plus ultra is a phrase that I've used repeatedly in the past for things that I've done. So I had a website called plus ultra and I had a podcast called plus ultra and now I've brought it back and that's the name of my premium content on my website. I've got videos and podcasts and I call it plus ultra because that's going beyond the paywall, you know, getting the extra stuff that the premium subscribers get. And it's an apt analogy. I don't feel bad about using it. I don't think this is some kind of dark concept. In fact, I think it's quite an exciting concept because it just means there's more stuff to explore. And just because the elite know how to use it doesn't mean that we can't learn how to use it too. Right. And I think we may very well be in a time period in which the veil is being lifted you know, we started off talking about the portals, which Pro 77 found that seem to be at least there's one behind the moon and one behind the sun. And there may be another one somewhere in the sky. And supposedly those doors open at certain parts of the year. And I think this year we're seeing some special changes around this time in the sky, perhaps indicating that the veil is lifting, that different streams of light are getting into our system and we're being allowed to see some of the extra stuff. But I don't know how it's going to turn out. I hope it's a happy ending here, right. but it does seem like the governments of the world are trying hard to hide it all behind a veil of artificial clouds. Well, it definitely could be possible. I mean, this material ties into a lot of strange little threads that guests have brought up in the past. I mean, Walter Bosley not only does he have a book, Latitude 33, about Disney being built specifically on a ley line for energetic purposes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could be taking that way further, but it's a related idea. And he also talks about the Sonora Aero Club, which is a group, a secret group from America's early days that involved... Germans who seem to be making these flying crafts that were well outside of the norm, way off the radar, uh, technologically speaking, to what was being worked on. And there was a secret society basically built around the knowledge of these crafts. And what's strange is that Charles Delshaw had drawings of these crafts and on one of them, it says Trump right across the top. And this was before really? Trump was elected president. Yeah, I mean, this is crazy. I cannot get over that image. And I just think it connects so well. And so here you have Disney being built for a sp specific energetic purpose on a specific geolocation and that Trump might be involved in a secret society that has higher technology. I mean, you mentioned Tesla and Edison being in this supposed club. 
I mean, what is UFO technology all about is electrogravitics. Maybe there's secrets of electricity that open these portal ways. Maybe that's what the Bermuda Triangle was all about. Maybe there's a natural one there. You could even look at Admiral Byrd's story and the hollow earth thing where Admiral Byrd is flying over a pole and looking down and seeing green land that shouldn't exist. Well, maybe he's looking through one of those gateways. I mean, there are a lot of old stories that people have drawn conclusions to that are different. But if you walk those conclusions back and just look at the details of the story, you might be looking at a secret hidden hyperspace kingdom. Yes, exactly. Right on. Well, fascinating stuff as always, Tracy. You've managed to tie in a ton of symbolism, mythology, the plot lines of famous works, and possibly revealed a pretty massive secret. Any idea where this work is taking you or what the next chapter is going to be? It's all about the anal birth of the homunculus, my friend. All right. <laughs> yes. It's all about that. Well, that sounds uh, like fun stuff. <laughs> That's all I have to say, man. That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I do love the work. Maybe we'll talk about John D and anal births in the future, but tell the people where they can read, watch, and subscribe to your stuff for more. Sure. TracyTwyman.com. And when you get there, I would recommend looking for the Plus Ultra Premium Membership button and signing up so that you can see and hear absolutely everything that I present. Right on. Yeah, see, I only got Plus here, but you got Plus Ultra. Clearly that next level. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah, of course. You got to have that Ultra aspect. Man, I'm missing you out. You should go Ultra. <laughs> Well, I do think it's really awesome material, the hidden hyperspace kingdoms, the plus ultra secret society that possibly unlocked this, the new meaning to the symbols we see in the black cube and the Masonic tracing board and just the honorary 33rd degree, how it's kind of a quasi between the worlds degree and quite possibly an allusion to a place that exists in the same way. And maybe Walt Disney knows about it and built a park around a secret doorway to take children to. <laughs> it's just great. So awesome stuff. You are the best. Thanks for sharing your latest and keep at it. Thank you very much. You got it. Holy hell and hallelujah, people. This was one hell of a return to the weird rides we all know and love. And if you were playing that drinking game where you take a shot every time I say provocative, then I doubt you're driving anywhere for a while because I said that almost every time I talked, but what other word really does justice to the ideas on the table today? I loved it, and time flew by so quickly I didn't even get to ask Tracy about getting cut off mid-interview on Coast to Coast AM. I didn't hear it myself, but apparently Tracy was on there just a few weeks ago. Nothing strange there. She's done Coast to Coast plenty of times. Great promotional opportunity. And as she was talking about this very stuff, they cut to commercial, hung up on her, and then came back and went to open lines like nothing happened. I don't know if it was the tiptoeing towards the flat earth perspective that got under their skin or terms like anal birth, but apparently they weren't having it. And I don't know what to make of some of this stuff. Like, she's interpreting symbolism and mythology and esoteric doctrine and looking at it several ways, literally, figuratively, related to other material. And the idea that abusing children violently and sexually has a purpose in elite magic, that's a persistent theme for the conspiracy world. Long time running. They used to say that this was for life extension. Now they're pretty open about using younger people for blood transfusions. And if you listen to the personal accounts of guys like Jay Parker, this abuse is pretty real in satanic style cults. But I do get an icky feeling when the material starts to sound a little homosexually derogatory. I mean, tell it like it is. If something's in the material, then it's in the material. I would not want to censor it. But I do think we need a pretty clear and distinct separation between gay and pedophilic. And I know I keep mentioning this book, Sex and Rockets, John Carter's book about Jack Parsons and his occult leanings. But he writes a lot about the Babylon workings and the attempts by Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard to make a moon child. They were even in written correspondence with Crowley at the time. But in Sex and Rockets, he does say Parsons seemed to be a bit of a swinger and maybe bi. But the attempts to birth a moon child revolve mostly around this woman, Marjorie Cameron. 
She was a woman in the Navy, served in D.C. as an aide to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, retired, moved to California, and joined the Agape Lodge, which was a house that Parsons owned in Pasadena. He basically just opened it up as a bohemian occult fraternity. And on the day that she arrived, Parsons' diary says that he, quote, invoked the goddess Babylon. So Parsons is out in the desert alone, and Babylon appeared, and then he translated the Liber 49, which Parsons saw as the fourth chapter of the Book of the Law. And Babylon says, hey, man, I'm sending you an elemental. I'm sending you a vessel that will birth you a moon child. You're forbidden from telling her that she has this role to play as the vessel for the moon child, but you're going to know her because the sign is going to be that she's going to come to you and reveal that she saw a silver cigar-shaped UFO. And that apparently did happen. Cameron did see a silver cigar-shaped UFO, and she did tell Parsons about it, and then he knew that she was the vessel. Parsons called Cameron his elemental in a letter to Crowley, saying that she had green eyes and red hair as predicted, and Cameron and Parsons spent two weeks in bed banging it out, and she got pregnant. And then it gets weird because Cameron did say that she had two of Jack Parsons' abortions, and she claimed well after he died that actually nine years after the working, rather than nine months, she did have a moon child. But it's really hard to know what that means. They just describe a moon child as a child born on the astral plane rather than bringing something into physical existence. But I guess there's multiple interpretations, and I just don't know. You got a lot of stuff going on. Sex, magic, and spirit babies. It's easier for me to talk about hidden hyperspace kingdoms, though. And I know that the model here is that penetrating the black sun is the key and lock mechanism that opens these portals, apparently but I still have a hard time really wrapping my head around how that would work. But we did get to talk about QAnon a little bit today, probably not as much as people would have wanted, but I heard Tracy podcasting about Q, and it was very good, but once she said that it wasn't fresh in her mind, I knew we couldn't spend too much time on it. No big deal, though, because this one ranks pretty high on my far-out speculation scale. But I do love the threads that make it seem plausible. I like the Disney tie-ins. I like the timeliness and the Crow tie-in. And I do highly recommend checking out Tracy's website. She's been definitely working hard on all this stuff. And I respect that work ethic quite a bit. I hope you were intrigued by her ideas. Definitely let her know if you feel so inclined. Lately, I've had several guests come back and tell me they've received great feedback from THC fans particularly Paul LaViolette and Dr. Kolbaba, so big thanks for being cool. I know so many audiences aren't, actually. In fact, there was a lot of drama with another show that's somewhat in our wheelhouse, and they ended up shutting down their Facebook group because their own audience, I guess, was trolling them that hard or something, which is just night and day from the THC Facebook group or the Plus Forum. The biggest slice of the THC listening pie seems to just be cool people who like interesting stuff. And that makes me feel like I'm cultivating the right sort of audience. We're here to get an education, maybe do some speculation, have a good time, try on some new models for what might be possible, vent. It's all good stuff. We know there are secrets. Now what are they? Could they be this? I personally think we do have a precedent for the possibility of portals to other realms, in a big way, actually. The psychedelic experience, astral travel, lucid dreaming, legends like the Bermuda Triangle, and ancient megalithic sites that are said to have been portals. I know I've heard legends that could fit that mold. Ley lines and geomancy. Is it possible that some of the geometric data that the Freemasons hold dear involves control over these realms or control over the doorways? I am more than convinced that ideas we see in sci-fi or popular books and novels and even like James Bond, for example, you know, literature and films are created that contain storylines of classified type information because the authors have those connections, usually through military intelligence or the lodge or the bathhouse or whatever. So to apply that to Atlas Shrugged, to The Wizard of Oz, Peter Pan, in fact, on Disney's website, you can watch the exact scene where the kids fly to Neverland. I'll link it in the show notes. 
but they follow a star and it morphs at the last second into that type of DMT trip geometric pattern. And it does make you think about the idea that maybe something's being revealed in all of this. Provocative stuff. Thanks for listening again and for being so cool. Sign up for THC Plus. It's only five bucks a month or 60 a year. I work pretty hard on giving you better service than you'll get at Applebee's, but you give that guy five bucks. Is he out here bringing you hidden hyperspace kingdoms with your Mai Tai? I don't think so. In fact, in the Plus show today, we got into moon theories and mythology, Irano, Skya, and Saturn, Tracy's communication with an entity claiming to be Mithras and its channel dancers, Diamonds, the Superman logo, and hyperspace, Pink Floyd and the Great Pyramid. Think about the imagery there. This is one of my favorite parts of the whole damn thing. But also the new chronology movement and how it relates, changing reality with magic, the prospect that John D. himself is the Demiurge, Bloomberg and the Mithraeum, the Tower of Babel connection, and another provocative question, is Mecca at the real North Pole? Provocative, provocative stuff, friends. $5 a month, 60 a year, and you can get the Plus feed on any device with ease. You can also download the THC music and join the conversation with other plus people. It's a good time. Until we meet again, I'm out of here. Your move, reality splitting scientists of the secret plus ultra order, free Masonic hyperspace headmasters, and villains beyond the veil. Your fucking move. You know the plan has always been to hack your brain. MK Ultra's trying to drive you insane. They'll explode your heart if they think that's what it takes You think I'm answering the phone? Well, I ain't You gotta keep the curtains drawn Cause you don't want anyone thinking you're at home Well, you're not You should tape the mail slot And baby, if I seem withdrawn Let me say it's cause I just don't wanna go and get whacked Maybe you should know that the trauma affects you like it does everyone It's just the game plan, it's what the world's become They want a pat down and a swap Don't you see what's going on? Well now you know You're better keeping on your own Cause you can see the masters lie too much Oh baby, you can only trust yourself and if you think the system's out of touch, it is, and you can only trust yourself. I hope you know the elite aren't your friends. They'll suck out everything from you in the end. And if for some reason you think I might be wrong, I wonder where you got that opinion from. You gotta keep the curtains strong Cause you don't want anyone thinking you're at home Well, you're not You should tape the mail slot And baby, if I seem withdrawn Let me say it's cause I just don't wanna go and get whacked Maybe you should know that The trauma affects you like it does everyone It's just the game plan It's what the world's become Pat down and a swap Don't you see what's going on? Well, now you know You're better keeping on your own Cause you can see The masters lie too much Oh, baby, you can only trust yourself And if you think The system's out of touch It is and you can only trust yourself think that these problems are small or maybe they aren't registering at all now they know you're naive and vulnerable you won't believe all of the stunts that they'll pull cause you can see the masters lie too much oh baby you can only trust yourself and if you think the system
comes out of touch it is and you can only trust yourself because you can see the masters lie too much oh baby you can only trust yourself and if you think the system's out of touch it is and you can only trust yourself 